All right, welcome everybody to our third panel for the GFF conference, uh, which is on rereading myths and folklore in contemporary fantasy, at least that's how I titled it, trying to group together people uh, to the best of my abilities. Um, and we're going to hear talks today from Jennifer Neidhardt, Mark Schmidt and Rebecca Grass. And Rebecca's talk is going to be in German, so our discussion will also, we will try to stick to English, but it's completely possible to do this bilingually. Um, and as per usual, I pick up on the questions in the chat as we go along. So um, without further ado, I'm going to give it over to Jen Neidhardt, who is going to talk about Lovers from the Underground, Re revisions of the Hades Persephone myth in contemporary fantastic fiction. Okay. Um, yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Jennifer Neithardt. I am a PhD student at the Compar Department for Comparative Literature at Heinrich Heine Universität Düsseldorf. And in my research, I focus on queer revisions of Greek mythology, where I focus especially on popular literature, web comics, and also online fan communities. Um, yeah, as uh, just in use, um, I'll talk about revisions of the myth of Hades and Persephone. Um, I was originally going to introduce two novels, but of course they would get too long. So today I'll just provide a general introduction to you and then leave the rest to the open discussion. Um, I also brought a PowerPoint presentation. I just hope the screen sharing will work now. I'm trying, just trying to broadcast that now. <laughs> okay, so I hope everyone can see this now just uh, give me a quick shot if you don't um otherwise i'll just start now <clears throat> so yeah you can also see my contact data in case you have questions later okay <clears throat> he seized her against her will and aboard his golden car carried her off lamenting she uttered a piercing scream but there was not any amongst the immortals or mortal men who could who heard her call thus begins the mary demeter was written around around the seventh century bc it is one of the oldest sources for the rape of Persephone, the goddess of spring. While she's gathering flowers with other virgin goddesses, she is abducted by her uncle Hades, the god of the underworld, who plans to marry her against her will. From this day on, she spends half of the year in the underworld and the other half above the ground. While some prefer to read the virgin's rape metaphorically and consider it an origin myth for the cycle of seasons, feminist scholars and writers have heavily criticized the use of sanctified rape narratives in Greek and Roman mythology. I argue, though, that mythology is not contained within one single canonical text. Not unlike Butler's concept of gender performativity itself, it consists of, I quote, imitations without an original, end of quote. Uh, myths rely on complex processes of transmission, translation, and reinterpretation, and variations often heavily dependent on local traditions. Even the Homeric hymn itself was just based on many, it's just one of many interpretations and was most likely based on previous oral traditions. Uh, so works of queer feminist revision reclaim this transformative potential while retaining a critical stance to the problematic aspects of classical traditions. They challenge canonized readings and revisit classical texts from a new perspective. While some readings uh, employ mythical rape narratives in order to address contemporary debates about consent, Others attempt to reread and sometimes deliberately misread classical texts in a more optimistic and transformative fashion. Popular revisions of the Hades and Persephone myth are among the most prominent examples for such optimistic transformations. Searching fan communities on social media for the two deities, one rarely encounters depictions of sexual violence. Instead, the relationship between Hades and Persephone is now considered the, quote, best relationship in the mythos and, quote, power couple. There are countless webcomics, memes, poems, or romance novels dedicated to this relationship. And on the slide, you can see three of the most popular web webcomics that deal with this material. So as you can see, these revisions do not depict Persephone as a passive victim, but instead reimagine her as a quirky and energetic young woman. Hades, on the other hand, is now considered, quote, husband goals, end of quote, rather than a terrifying lord of the dead. In her Persephone to Hades, feminist Instagram poet Nikita Gill revisits the relationship between the two deities. You're still the kindest thing that ever happened to me, even if that is not how our tale is told. Where everyone told me I was destined to be a forgotten goddess who nurtured flowers and fostered gold meadows, you saw, the icon in my saw how the icon in my blood yearned for its own throne. You showed me how our love can transform the darkest, coldest realm into the happiest of homes. 
Gill's poem presents itself as a contemporary deconstruction of the myth and highlights the unreliability of mythical storytelling. It presents Hades not only as an idealized lover, but also highlights his role as an enabler for Persephone's true potential. She's not merely a maiden goddess of spring, but instead lives up to the literal meaning of her name, which means bringer of dest destruction. Consequently, these readings challenge patriarchal, uh, patriarchal interpretations and reclaim the goddess's power, which is often repressed by social conventions. These conservative forces are often represented by her mother Demeter, who is now reread as a, quote, helicopter parent, end of quote, uh, or gods such as Zeus, Poseidon, or Apollo, who are famously known for their numerous rapes and troubled marriages. This Tumblr user neatly summarizes this rereading. Why does Tumblr romanticize Hades so much? I don't know, Clarice, maybe we're just tired and life is uncertain and we like the idea of a stable husband with a, sta with a steady job and a big dog and his own place away from all the loud shape-shifting king party gods. I would argue, however, that there are more cultural factors that contribute to this romanticized revision. In fact, uh, the relationship between feminist writings and diabolical lovers is by no means a recent literary phenomenon. In their influential study, The Mad Woman in the Attic, Gilbert and Yuvar argue that classical literature only provides two female archetypes, that of the angel and that of the monster. In order to escape patriarchal conventions, feminist writers have therefore often felt the need to embrace their own madness and reclaim diabolical archetypes. They've always questioned and even reversed the role between the good God and the evil Satan. Following romantic traditions, they often depict the fallen angel as a liberator from patriarchal norms and turn the biblical Eve into a, quote, female Prometheus, end of quote, um, rather than a passive victim. Gilbert and Huber explain, it is not surprising that women, identifying at their most rebellious with Satan, at their least with rebellious Eve, and almost all the time with the romantic poets, should have been similarly obsessed with the apocalyptic social transformation a, revi a revision of Milton brings about. However, it is not only the factor of identification which connects feminist writers to the archetype of the devil. Instead, he can also fulfill the role of an idealized lover. And they conclude, um, for not only is Milton Satan in certain crucial ways very much like women, he is also enormously attractive to women. For if Eve is sins as well as Satan's double, then Satan is to Eve what he is to sin, both a lover and a daddy. Due to an ongoing process of transmission, our collective memory tends to blur the lines between the Christian hell, the Greek underworld, or medieval fairylands. For instance, Dante Alighieri in his Divine Comedy has numerous figures from mythology drawing money through hell, and the medieval Roman Sir Orfeo transfers the myth of Orpheus and Eurydice to a, to a Celtic fairy court. The lines between these archetypes are still blurry, and consequently, contemporary adaptations merge depictions of the Christian devil, fairy rulers, and the Greek Hades. This is clearly reflected in the feminist revisions that I'm addressing in this talk. The figure of the liberating devil is, however, not entirely flawless. Um, while this diabolical savior figure does provide an alternative way of life to the female protagonist, one might question whether she might not merely exchange one form of patriarchy for another. Um, this, uh, this question is, complex and not easily answered, and that's why I would like to hand it over to the open discussion room instead. And um, that's it from my part. I'm looking forward to, to your comments. And here are my sources. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. All right, thank you. Um, and we're going to immediately go on to Mark Schmidt, who's going to talk about uh, folk horror as a political mode. Yes, thank you. Um, first of all, thank you for the invitation and thank you for um, doing this um, this compensation conference uh, via Zoom, which I think is a great idea. Um, I hope you can all see my screen now. Um, so I'm going to talk about folk horror as a political mode. Since filmmaker Piers Haggard during an interview for the documentary A History of Horror described his 1971 film The Blood on Satan's Claw as a folk horror film, the term has taken on a life of its own. It initially described a cycle of films from Don't the late... see your screen if you're oh, sure. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> just, just to make sure. Can you see it now? Mm, Can you actually oh, see something? Okay. You. Uh, Sorry. Hmm. Okay, let's try it again. Now that seems to work. Now you, okay, perfect. <laughs> right, uh, sorry. Okay. 
Let's just start. Oh, okay. It's okay. Okay, so um, back to the beginning. Since filmmaker Pierce Haggard during an interview for the documentary A History of Horror described his 1971 The Blood on Satan's Claw as a folk horror film, the term has taken on a life of its own. It initially described a cycle of films from the late 1960s and early 70s set in isolated rural communities. Michael Reeves, Witchfinder General, Robin Hardy's The Wicker Man, and Piers Haggard's own film. Folk horror has since been used to label any cultural text that engages with British folklore, to quote Adam Scoville, to imbue itself with a sense of the arcane for eerie, uncanny, or horrific purposes. One that dramatizes a clash between such arcania and its presence within close proximity to some form of modernity. As I will argue today, folk horror isn't so much a confined genre rather than a mode based on a variety of characteristics, tropes, and motifs. Folk horror is a broad term and isn't confined to horror films or literature, but can also relate to visual art, documentary films, music, or performances. Representations in the folk horror mode usually engage with remote rural settings, the conflict of the rural versus the urban, tradition versus modernity, secularity versus folklore or spirituality, Christianity versus the occult, and the human versus the natural world. Among other things, folk horror is also part of what Smith and Hughes have called eco-Gothic, and a lot of the political potential of folk horror representations and narratives stems from their engagement with ecological questions, especially in films like The Wicker Man, but also to a certain extent, uh, the more recent film Apostle. My idea to think about folk horror as a mode is also inspired by Tom Hillard, who suggests that the Gothic itself isn't so much a genre as a mode, and by David Southwell, who calls folk horror a Gothic mode. This makes it easier to productively analyze certain texts, even if they're very eclectic, even, and even if they don't seem to adhere to any genre-related rules. So what about the political aspects of folk horror? I recently came across this rather odd customer review on Amazon for a book called A Watcher's Guide to Folk Horror. The reviewer takes issue with what they consider to be the author's political attitudes. To quote, it often felt like a chore to read because you knew it, that at some point there would be a rant about religion, female exploitation, racial inequality, conservatism, nationalism, just stick to the films. I would like to object to this customer criticism and suggest that folk horror has always been political and that sticking to the films inevitably means to engage with their political implications. I would argue that the reason why folk horror has gained so much attention in the past few years is because creators of folk horror grapple with similar socio-political issues as the directors in the 60s and 70s. As Adam Scoville rightly observes, the holy trinity of folk horror, which find a general blood on Satan's claw and wicker man, were all summoned into existence during what can be called the British counterculture movement, almost acting as signposts for its title high point, in 1968 in Witchfinder and the dying post Charles Manson embers of Wicker Man. To briefly illustrate, Witchfinder General, starring horror icon Vincent Price, deals with the English Civil War in the 17th century, but its study of collective paranoia, superstition, institutionalized misogyny, and sadistic male opportunists rising to power as so-called witchfinders is very clearly amalgamating an allegorical treatment of the historical traumas of the 20th century, the Holocaust and German fascism, as well as the political and social tumults and insecurities of the years of its release, 1968. It is what Adam Lowenstein has called a confrontational text, which, to quote, invites us to recognize our connection to historical trauma across the axes of text, context, and spectatorship. Such films do so through the agency of an allegorical moment situated at the unpredictable and often painful juncture where past and present collide. The political potential of folk horror lies in exactly this hauntological collision of past and present, which, as I would argue, opens a window onto the future. As Paul Watson in his series of drawings called England's Dark Dreaming and David Southwell in his foreword to these drawings have argued, the act of unearthing is a central trope of folk horror. Ancient horrors like the deformed demonic skull in Blood on Satan's Claw are unearthed and haunt the present. 
for Paul Watson, this confrontation with the past can lead to what he calls cries to the future. In many folk horror texts, old orders collapse or are at least critically confronted with alternatives. In Wicker Man, the film's protagonist, a staunch policeman and Christian, investigates the disappearance of a child in a remote island community in the Hebrides. He is horrified at the islanders' ideas of pagan religion, free love, and communion with nature, and tries his best to enact his notion of order and religious conformity before he is sacrificed to the sun gods in the eponymous Wicker Man. In a similar way, the recent wave of new folk horror films from the UK and other countries focus on the fragility of social order and cultural norms. Robert Eager's The Witch in New England Folktale uses the setting of a Puritan community in the American colonies to stage the conflict between a patriarchal Christian order, youth and femininity. The German film Hagazusa explores similar themes revolving around Christian beliefs and female sexuality. Coming to the topic of this conference and to conclude, uh, imagining alternatives, I would argue that the allegorical confrontation with the past in the present suggests scenarios for the future. Given the nature of horror, most of the endings of folk horror narratives don't immediately strike one as optimistic. However, some folk horror endings offer ambiguous or happy endings with a morbid twist. Gareth Evans' recent film, Apostle, is a case in point and might be closest to a weird version of a happy end, at least from an eco-Gothic perspective. The film depicts an isolated island community, which in a desire to break free from the dogmas of the British king in the early 20th century, has formed its own cult, offering blood sacrifices to a goddess only known as her. The casting of Michael Sheen as the dubious cult leader lends itself to political allegory. In three films, Sheen has previously played Tony Blair, the former British prime minister responsible for the New Dawn rhetoric of New Labour, as well as for the Iraq war. Likewise, his character in Apostle lies to the inhabitants of the island about being able to deliver them from evil. Of course, his idea of separatism evokes the political turmoil of contemporary Brexit Britain. However, of all people, it is the film's anti-hero Thomas, a former priest modeled after the biblical apostle, the doubting Thomas, who is chosen by the goddess as her successor. The film's final images, with Thomas literally becoming one with the plants on the island and thereby entering a true communion with nature, in ecological terms, points towards a future beyond the human and beyond the damages of the Anthropocene. Thank you very much. Thank you. And so we're going to go to our third talk uh, by Rebecca Gras. On, and I'm going to switch to German now, or probably not, because my brain is wired weirdly with both languages. Rebellen as a soldat in this individuelle gegen this uniforme in the fantastic Rebecca. Ja, vielen Dank um, für die Einleitung. Vielen Dank auch generell für die Organisation. Und um, auch danke an meine um, Vorredner. Mein Thema habt ihr vorhin schon gehört, noch kurz zu mir. Ich bin Doktorandin an der Ruhr-Universität Bochum im Fachbereich Komparatistik und hatte mich schon einmal kurz vorher mit Soldatendarstellungen befasst und bin dabei zu der Auffassung gekommen, dass Soldatendarstellungen prinzipiell immer politisch sind und Rebellentum dazu genommen, ist es da dementsprechend natürlich auch. Natürlich ist man jetzt zeitlich eingeschränkt und dementsprechend werde ich nur kurz ähm, das Themenfeld umreißen. Ich habe drei der größten Werke aus Fantasy, Fantastik und Science Fiction der letzten Jahre untersucht. Tolkiens Der Herr der Ringe, George Lucas Star Wars Reihe und J.K. Rowling's Harry Potter. Natürlich sind die sehr umfassend und ich habe es jetzt stark runtergebrochen und es gibt bestimmt viel, was man anzweifeln oder worüber man diskutieren kann. Allen drei gemein ist das Thema Krieg nach dem David gegen Goliath Prinzip. Es gibt einen meist autokratischen, tendenziell faschistischen Herrscher mit ähm, einem Herr, der gegen eine tendenziell demokratisch gesinnte Rebellengruppe kämpft. Ähm, ein Soldat, kurz zu definieren, ist ein in Sold stehendes, das heißt ein bezahltes Mitglied eines ständigen Heeres, während Rebellen jetzt natürlich nach meiner Definition etwas eingeschränkter, eine kleine Gruppe sind, die gegen eine bestehende herrschende Macht bzw. eine einflussnehmende Macht Widerstand leistet mit dem Ziel, 
eine neue Ordnung zu etablieren oder die alte Ordnung zu wahren. Wenn wir uns jetzt die drei Werke angucken, haben wir auf der einen Seite die Armee Saurons, die vor allen Dingen aus Orks besteht, gegen die Gefährten, die ich jetzt beispielhaft für alle Widerständler in Mittelerde nehme, in der Herr der Ringe. In Star Wars sind es die Sturmtruppler gegen die Rebellen oder auch gegen den Widerstand in Episode 7 bis 9. Und in Harry Potter sind es die Todesser, wobei man eben da einen schwierigen Heeresstatus hat gegen den Orden des Phönix. Heere sind per se hierarchisch organisiert ähm, und der Soldat nimmt in dieser Hierarchie tendenziell eine untergeordnete Position ein, während es eben Einführer gibt, während Rebellengruppen zumeist demokratisch organisiert sind, sodass alle meist gleichberechtigt sind mit einem weisen Ratgeber oder Anführer wie Gandalf, Lea Organa oder Dumbledore. Soldaten bilden im Unterschied zu Rebellen eine Masse, eine Heeresmasse, während Rebellen immer zahlenmäßig unterlegen sind und jeder eigene Züge und Fähigkeiten mitbringt, die nicht unbedingt massenkompatibel sind und somit etwas Besonderes. Das Wichtigste eben, was ich in meinem Titel schon aufgegriffen habe, sind die Uniformität von Soldaten und die Individualität von Rebellen. Soldaten sind eben uniformiert, das heißt gleich gekleidet, gleich ausgerüstet und meistens auch gleich ausgebildet, während Rebellen divers sind, in den meisten Fällen aus verschiedenen Völkern oder auch Bevölkerungsschichten stammen, ähm, verschieden ausgebildet sind bzw. oftmals gar nicht mal militärisch ausgebildet sind und eben, wie schon gesagt, verschiedene Spezialgebiete haben und entsprechend verschieden gekleidet sind. Am Beispiel von Mittelerde ist es, dass Saurons Armee zwar nicht nur aus Orks besteht, aber schwerpunktmäßig und diese eben volksspezifisch gekleidet und ähnliche Waffen führen und auch ähnlich ausgerüstet sind, während die Gefährten in dem Fall aus verschiedenen Völkern stammen, also es gibt Hobbits, ein Zauberer, Menschen, Zwerge und Elben und diese alle eben völkerspezifische Waffen und Kleidung tragen, aber eben auch einander im Notfall ausrüsten. Ganz pragmatisch ist es bei den Sturmtruppen, die sind Einfach alle total uniform. Die meisten nehmen niemals den Helm ab. Sie sind gleich ausgebildet, gleich gekleidet, gleich bewaffnet. Es gibt gar keine Unterschiede. Den einzigen Bruch gibt es in Episode 7. Und ähm, der ist wiederum etwas Spezielles. Des Weiteren führen Soldaten Befehle aus. Sie haben damit keine eigene Meinung oder Haltung, sondern sie müssen funktionieren. Und das ist ihre Aufgabe, auch in den Werken. Ähm, während die Rebellen alle unterschiedliche Antriebskräfte und auch teils unterschiedliche Ziele haben, ist eins sie eben der Widerstand und das, was sie eben nicht wollen. Beispielsweise, die Gefährten haben zwar das Ziel, Sauron aufzuhalten, das Gute in Mittelerde zu behalten und siegen zu lassen, aber trotzdem haben sie auch unterschiedliche Gründe, warum sie überhaupt auf diese Fahrt gehen. Beispielsweise möchte Sam in erster Linie die Elben sehen und Frodo helfen, während Aragorn sein königliches Erbe antreten will oder auch muss. Des Weiteren kann man sagen, dass Soldaten Massenware sind. Sie gelten tendenziell als dumm und es sind also alle gleich. Es sind keine Individuen, die man großartig unterscheiden kann, sondern sie einen sich eben durch ihre Nicht-Spezialität, während Rebellen eigene Entscheidungen treffen und heroisch sind und ihr eigenes Leben für das Gemeinwohl riskieren. Allerdings sind eben Soldaten dadurch, dass sie nicht individuell sind, vor allen Dingen auch quasi fremdgesteuert und ihr Gehorsam wird auch durch Gewalt erzwungen. Wer gut ist, wird belohnt, wer nicht, funktioniert wird bestraft und der Umgang mit den Soldaten ist geprägt durch ständige Abwertung, eine strikte Einhaltung der Hierarchie und oftmals auch Demütigung. Das heißt, von oben kommen die Befehle und eben auch die Ausführungen und oftmals auch gegen die eigenen Leute, sodass es kaum Zusammenhalt gibt, es sei denn die, die Furcht vor dem Zorn ihrer Anführer. Die Rebellen hingegen kämpfen aus Überzeugung und deswegen wird niemand bestraft oder belohnt, eben auch, weil es keinen einzelnen Führer gibt oder Anführer gibt. Es gibt kaum Hierarchien und es wird in der Regel diskutiert und gemeinsam entschieden oder eben auch gestritten, aber es wird niemand gezielt gedemütigt. Sprachlich lässt sich das daran fixieren, dass ganz viele Soldaten auch lächerlich gemacht werden. Es gibt Beleidigungen untereinander oder eben hierarchische Beleidigungen und ähm, viele werden gezielt in ihrer Uniformität und auch in ihrer eben dadurch nicht besonders herausragenden Intelligenz beschrieben. 
Bei den Rebellen untereinander gibt es meistens ein gegenseitiges Bestärken, weil es wird gemeinsam für ein Ziel gekämpft. Man hat sowieso eine schlechtere Ausgangslage und das soll gestärkt werden. Um das Ganze politisch festzuhalten, ist natürlich Krieg immer politisch und dementsprechend sind auch Soldaten immer politisch, denn sie stehen für ein System. Und meine These ist, dass Individuen und damit Rebellen zur Identifikation einladen und damit auch zur Nachahmung. Also es ist ein Appell pro Diversität und Toleranz und ein Appell dafür, für das Richtige einzustehen und eben auch für Zivilcourage. Man könnte auch vermuten, dass da Soldaten keine Individuen sind, es als nicht so schlimm gilt, sie zu töten. Es könnte eventuell eine Rechtfertigung für Kriegsgewalt gegen mechanisierte Truppen für das Richtige sein. Dankeschön. Dankeschön. Dann können wir auch direkt in die Diskussion einsteigen. Also am besten einfach jetzt alle Panelisten ähm, ihre Kamera. Genau, wunderbar, Dankeschön. Um, yeah, I'm just gonna switch back to English because again, there's a few people listening that don't speak German, but I'm sure we're gonna manage. Um, yeah, thanks again, everybody, for interesting talks. I know the the overarching topic I tried to assign to you works sort of, kind of, maybe. <laughs> um, it was mostly a practicality question, obviously, since we didn't have that many speakers. Um, so I'm just gonna. Um, yeah um maybe ask if if there's anything on your end first that you want to maybe ask each other or if you feel there's any kind of through lines that you picked up on um so just give you the first opportunity and we already have a few things um popping up in the chat as well um i actually have a question for both of you <laughs> um I'll just start with Mark. Um, so thank you for your presentation as well. It was really interesting and I really liked how it tied in with my topic. So we kind of just went hand in hand, which, which was great. Um, I really liked how you addressed this whole debate of keeping politics out of it, quote unquote, because of course you can't keep politics out of it at all. And it's always my, always my pet peeve when people do this. So thanks for addressing that. And yeah, since we were both talking about diabolical figures or figures of the devil, I was just wondering, um, if you could maybe ex yeah, elaborate on that a little, how devil or the devils or maybe also yeah, um, clerical people are addressed in the films that you discuss, and if there's also some kind of role reverse that I discussed in my talk. Uh, yeah, um, definitely. So, um, I mean, there is a, a, a number, a range of villains in, in these folk horror narratives. Um, the ones I've focused on now are, uh, of course, the witch finder general, um, who proclaims to be a man of God or a clerical sort of figure um, who is uh, or claims to be able to to identify uh, witches right uh, and and um, put them to trial and to execution um, and he he very clearly uses this power vacuum in uh, in England during the time of the Civil War he's also based on on an actual historical figure um, Matthew Hopkins, the witch finder, um, and also in in the other films, it's it's usually very often men of of faith or religion um, who are uh, at the center. In, in the witch, it is the the father of the family who, um, because of his uh, extreme faith, is is actually expelled from the community with his family. Um, and in Apostle, uh, we have this tension between. Um, this, this um, person who was a, a man of God, um, but, but um, lost his faith. And we have this, this person, this priest played by uh, Michael Sheen, who, who claims to be a very um, religious person, even if it's an alternative religion in, uh, of sorts, um, and, and uses the, and abuses this um, to his advantage, right? Um, so these films are very clearly making statements about um, the, the abuses of power, especially when they come in the guise of, of religion and faith. Um, and also, I think uh, a lot of them are very critical of ideas of um, of the patriarchy and, and certain ideas of, of male dominance, right? Um, so, so very often we have this conflict um, between between uh, more modern ways of life and sexuality, um, and also spirituality, and these more traditional male-centered um, ideas. 
um, and also coming back to the the question of keeping politics out of it um, it's it's very clearly when when these narratives are all about power and sometimes even about you know something like the civil war a historical event um, it's very clearly um, of course um, these are political narratives right um, so you can't keep politics out of it if you want to do justice to the films so if you're actually interested in these films or in these narratives um, how can you not be interested in politics or the politics of the film right yeah i also think that even if you if politics are so to speak absent from your film they're still there because you just can't keep politics out of it in any right, way yeah. <laughs> absolutely yeah. um do you think there's a difference between the religion and the institution in these films or are these kind of yeah blurred between each other um yeah, there, there seems to be a difference in, in so far as there, there seems to be this kind of institutionalized religion and representatives of this, uh, like, for example, the policeman in The Wicker Man, who um, is introduced at the beginning of the film um, as um, an active, you know, practitioner of, of, um, of religion. And, and he, he's seen in a church giving a sermon even before he goes to this island to investigate. Um, and he is confronted with these more, you know, free thinking or seemingly free thinking um, people on this island. However, it's, it's never that clear cut. Um, the, the people on this island, of course, are still the horror film antagonists, right? And they do human sacrifices. Um, so the, the film doesn't necessarily want us to sympathize with them either, right? Um, so it's, it's, it's very ambivalent when it comes to, um, you know, um, clear cut antagonisms. Yeah, that's that's really interesting because my experience with the romantic tradition was similar mm -hmm. as well. So I felt like they heavily criticized the church as an institution, but then we're, we're kind of more favorable towards religion if practiced individually. Yeah. And also we're really assist assistant to in the completely glorify Satan, but they were also mm -hmm. kind of favorable towards him. So that's really interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, and talk yeah, yeah. <laughs> And yeah, talking about institutions, this actually ties in with my question to Rebecca, <laughs> which is a nice transition to that. Um, so you were talking about yeah the role of the rebels, as you said, very interestingly, and um, yeah about this uniformity of the soldiers versus the very diverse rebels. And since you were talking about Harry Potter, I was kind of interested in how you would treat uh, the Fantastic Beasts films, actually, because I was just thinking about the role of Grindelwald, and then it feels kind of the other way around because Grindelwald is kind of yeah depicted as a rebel to suppression uh, oppression and um, yeah kind of yeah rebelling against the system that exists so I was wondering if you were also going to address this in your talk um not yet <laughs> exactly because um I did watch the films but I remember them very badly so um, um I don't know I think it's um kind of a different universe it, it's in the universe but a different kind and um i didn't think about it yet sorry <laughs> yeah just uh when you look at gen um, yeah current movies and the trends in current movies do you think it's still like that because the examples you discussed were kind of a bit older <laughs> Um, so yeah, I was just wondering what was your impression when looking at contemporary movies from the past, let's say, five years or something? Um, yeah, I don't know exactly about movies, but with um, books, I think it's still... Um, I have to switch to German, my head doesn't work, I'm sorry. Um, by Büchern, bei Fantasy-Büchern vor allen Dingen ist mir das, das ist eigentlich der Grund, warum ich mich damit überhaupt auseinandergesetzt habe, ist, dass es immer noch so ist, dass Soldaten immer dumm sind und immer die Masse sind und das ist total prägnant irgendwie und ähm, ich, ich glaube, eins von Kai Meier hatte ich letztens, da ist mir das auch wieder so doll aufgefallen. Ähm, es ist irgendwie immer noch ziemlich aktuell, also irgendwie Kriegsthematik reißt ja auch in der Fantastik einfach überhaupt nicht ab. Es ist immer aktuell. Mit Film habe ich mich nicht so großartig auseinandergesetzt. Das ist eben auch in meinem Komparatistikstudium nie besonders präsent gewesen. Von daher kann ich dazu nicht so wahnsinnig viel sagen. Aber ich denke, die Identifikation mit Rebellenfiguren ist immer noch sehr gegeben. Sowohl 
in Filmen als auch in Büchern, also in der Literatur. Right. Um, I say we shift to the questions in the chat. Um, so Ashwami had asked, and I think this is mostly from Mark, um, how like it's just like Flannery um, celebrates the city or the Gothic or Neo-Victorian celebrates the haunted house castle mansion, um, almost identifying it as a character. Does folk horror personify its setting in some way? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I mean, coming back to Apostle and the Wicker Man, I would say that there is some degree of personification of the um, of the nature uh, setting of these islands involved. Um, very literally in, in Apostle, where um, plants seem to have agency, right? Uh, we see them grow and we see them actively grow into into people's bodies sometimes right um so they are somehow part of this goddess and, and this is by the way um one of the folk horror films where we actually do have supernatural elements uh, unlike witch find a general where of course we never have actual witches right because they're just a figment of the um you know male paranoid uh, imagination um, but in Apostle we definitely have this this kind of agency of the setting and, and of uh, the natural world um, in the Wicker Man uh, where we also don't have um, supernatural elements it's, it's left open whether um, you can actually appease the Sun God with the human sacrifice and whether apples will actually uh, grow after you've sacrificed a policeman right um, it's, it's um, left open and, and it suggested that it's a delusion um, of the islanders but you have um, especially in terms of filmic strategies um, it is suggested that in a way nature has agency um, on this island right and the final shot of the film is a beautiful shot um, of the sun going down um, in the ocean um, symbolizing in a way the sun god that the um, people on the island want to appease with this human sacrifice um, and, and in a way the the image itself seems to suggest that um, the natural world has this kind of agency right but still not in the way that the islanders believe um, it to have right so um, there's definitely a lot of focus and attention to the settings um, and, and how they act on the people living in them, in these folk horror narratives, yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, I, I also have a question for you, but I'm gonna move on to Julia's question for Jenny first, uh, which is, in these subversive feminist retellings of classic myths, women do seem to get a lot more agency. How would you say are power relations shifting overall then? Is there a particular image of masculinity emerging because of this? But yeah, that's actually something that I wanted to address that I just didn't get the time for. Um, I feel like the men are generally very, you know, supporting, very tender. Um, at least that's what I noticed with Hades, because um, you also sometimes have these twilight kind of relationships, you know, where you have this <laughs> Byronic dark lover who's kind of mysterious, but also kind of caring. And it's always this gray area between consent and not. Um, but in the feminist revisions, and especially of Hades and Persephone that I've analyzed, Hades is very much like a big soft heart. He's just a very caring guy. And especially in the webcomics that I wanted to address, you have this clear, um, yeah, parallel, uh, not parallel, but the clear contrast um, between Hades, who is portrayed as just his loyal, caring husband, and for example, Zeus or Poseidon, who is still pretty much like the mythical counter counterparts where they you know, go on <laughs> conquering sprees, either drastically raping women, but most of the time just acting like a playboy. And you kind of have the similar shift between the usual patriarchal god, like Zeus, for example, and Hades, who is more romanticized. Um, but it's actually it's pretty similar to how you can see the Christian god and Satan, how they reverse their roles. And you can also kind of see how these images of these gods that we have kind of merge in the, yeah, in the um, shared mem memory that we have of these gods. So in general, I would say that the female character is often very active, very, um, yeah, just your typical young adult protagonist, basically. And the man, is, as I said earlier, he's more like an enabler. So he's there and he's, he cares for her, um, but he doesn't really have any agency, um, especially in this one webcomic 
uh, Laura Olympus, it's really interesting because he's also stuck in an abusive relationship with a woman and it really much explores very drastically this fragility of masculinity that you don't often have. So you have, yeah, not only a revision of femininity, but masculinity as well, which I find very interesting. Oh, thank you. Um, so I had a question for Mark about, because you mentioned the casting of Michael Sheen in this, um, and I've been like, I have some random thoughts always about typecasting and how that might play in here. And I mean, with Sheen it's tricky because he has quite a range, uh, obviously in terms of it's not really typecasting, but there's always a question of what do people maybe expect from a certain actor. So one of my favorite actors being Jason Isaacs, who always gets, almost always gets cast as a villain. And because of that, people already have an expectation of what a certain character will probably do for a narrative, for instance. Um, so I was wondering how, if you could elaborate on that a bit. Uh, yeah, absolutely, I, I, I agree. Um, and I mean, I very much focused on, on um, the fact that, that he was cast three times as Tony Blair. Um, and that in a way he's, he's come to be associated with, especially after the Queen uh, in 2006 with, with the young Tony Blair. Um, and I think in, in the film Apostle, the, the typecasting um, works to a certain de extent, but then it's also, um, you could say, subversive, right? Um, because um, Michael Sheen himself said, about the the film that this was actually the first time that he was able to speak his own actual Welsh dialect uh, in a film role, right? Um, so so he actually plays a Welshman, um, and I think he has never played uh, an, an actual Welshman before, um, even though he's from Wales. Um, and so in a way, um, by the by by um, this focus on on his natural um you know dialect uh, as it were um he, he also subverts this typecasting as tony blair who is this you know uh, benign englishman um who then somehow falls from grace during his political career um but um again michael sheen's character in apostle he also has this, this kind of conflict between his public role as the priest and leader of this community and his own um, personal character weaknesses. And in a way, this then again resembles the way um, he approached Tony Blair as a character in these earlier films. Yeah. Thank you, that's very interesting. Um, I actually also had a question for Jen um, because you brought up these quotes from Tumblr um, and I was wondering if there's kind of like, how does fandom figure into what you're doing in a way? Because I mean, that this seems to be, that is a fandom of myth that's happening here with this reimagining of things. So I was wondering if you can elaborate. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So that's actually one of the, one of my research focuses that I'm working on, because what I've notice is that, there is that there's a clear contrast between feminist revisions that get published and feminist revisions that you see on the internet. Because when you look at novels like Madeleine miller Cersei, for example, or um, Pat Barker's Silence of the Girls, for example, it's mostly figures on female suffering and focuses on oppression and on rape. And of course, it ties in a lot with the Me Too narratives, which is really crucial. But then when you look into online fandom, it just is the complete opposite. So you see young queer female fans most of the time reappropriating these myths so they don't really deal with the problematic aspects. So most of the time it's kind of this utopian approach and I think it's, yeah, it, it also ties in a lot with fandom. So when you look at web comics or when you look at uh, Instagram poetry or just these Tumblr posts that I showed, um, it shows that there's a yeah fan base for these myths, so to speak, that don't necessarily deal with um, classical texts or literature or even the published uh, revisions that I just addressed. So it's mostly just fans taking these characters and just going wild and doing whatever they want. <laughs> so I think that's something really refreshing and empowering to that because I always try to find some kind of balance between a critical approach that also addresses this whole rape thematic and the binary approach, everything like that, but also take a look at how you can reappropriate these methods and make them some kind of personal utopia and how you can yeah, in, literally revisit them, re-advise them. 
So yeah, that's what I find really interesting. Yeah, definitely. Yes, I'm. I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm afraid to ask if there's slash fiction, fan fiction involving Hades, the Disney Hades. But um, Julia actually has another question uh, to follow up on that, which is: Is there, as often happens with queer fandom, mm -hmm. uh, an interactive element to it? So, like, do the fans themselves shape the comics? I think so. I've been looking at comments a lot, and fans often interact with the author, so it's a lot closer than a closer relationship than you would have with a published author and their fans, for example, because most of the time these comics update regularly, like on a weekly basis or on a two weekly basis. And what happens is that you have these comments that get voted most popular. So every time you look on Webtoon and uh, you read the comics on Webtoon, Webtoon <laughs> and you scroll down the comic at the bottom you will see the most popular comments so you always get a kind of idea what's the general yeah general opinion of fans what what kind of approach do the fans have to these comics and um, there's also um, a general faq session for example that they post regularly so you have this kind of yeah it's almost like a folk tradition in a way because they shape these stories together and it's not this very um yeah this the single author god who decides how the story should be told which I think is also really a problem. Yeah. And fits in with myth, right? Because I mean, oral history, oral narratives have always been that way. And so that kind of repeats history repeating itself, I think. Um, so we don't have any more questions in the chat right now. Obviously there's still an opportunity if somebody has one. Um, is there anything else on your end that may have come up now? Um, I think we, um, during our email exchange before the panel, we actually had one aspect which uh, we thought would would be a through line uh, um, for all of our papers, which would be the politicization of fandom, right? I mean, you've already um, talked uh, about this to a certain extent, but I would like uh, to ask Rebecca what you think about the politicization of fandom um, in connection to these franchises, right? Obviously, Star Wars, Harry Potter, uh, Lord of the Rings, these are huge franchises. Um, and we have seen, and, and you've hinted at this uh, in your talk, we have seen the politicization of casting choices like John Boyega as the stormtrooper in, in the recent Star Wars films, right? Um, where we didn't have a political message, as it were, in the text itself, but we had uh, certain political associations and, and connotations um, before the film was actually out, right? Um, there was a certain political reaction um, among the, the fans of this franchise. Um, and I wanted to maybe focus uh, the, the final parts of the discussions on this question of political or politicized fandom um, when it comes to the franchises that you talked about, but also when it comes to um, Tumblr act activism um, and, and myth fandom, as it were, in, in uh, Jen's talk. So what are your takes on this? Ich finde generell sehr spannend, dass ja eigentlich in allen drei von mir besprochenen Texten zum Beispiel eine klare Identifikationsmöglichkeit angeboten wird, die aber in den in Franchise und so weiter häufig gebrochen wird. Also es gibt total viele Stormtrooper-Kostüme oder dergleichen oder Bilder und dergleichen. Das ist ja ja, nun mal eigentlich nichts Individuelles, aber es wird sich total gerne aufgehängt oder damit gespielt und dergleichen, eben weil es vielleicht die Möglichkeit gibt, dass hinter dieser Uniformität doch was Individuelles ist, was es zu entdecken gibt. Das heißt, es gibt irgendwo noch was Geheimnisvolles zum einen. Zum anderen gibt es aber auch, ähm, glaube ich, immer die Möglichkeit, etwas Böses in etwas Gutes umzuformen, dass man vielleicht doch irgendwo Einfluss nehmen kann, wenn man damit spielt. Ähm, und das finde ich eigentlich sehr spannend, dass viel von den, ähm, ja, böseren oder auch eben nicht individuelleren Charakteren aufgegriffen werden und teils verarbeitet und vermarktet werden. Ich denke, dass es, ähm, ja, weil, weil sie vielleicht auch mehr Raum noch bieten, weil sie noch mehr Seiten haben, die einfach nicht gezeigt werden. Aber ich finde generell ist das offenbar eine Sache, die sich sehr durchzieht in unseren drei Themen. Sehr spannend auf jeden Fall. Ja, danke. Ähm, ich, das ist auch eigentlich schön, dass wir jetzt nochmal über Fandom gesprochen haben. Um, it's nice that we talked about Fandom now, because and tomorrow's panel is on Fandom. 
as well. Not the one right after, but the one tomorrow. Um, and if there's nothing more, I would like to wrap this up here because apparently uh, there's a technical issue with the other panel and I actually have to start it to get it. <laughs> so it's happening. Um, so I want to thank you again uh, for your great talks and um, I hope we actually get to meet in person at some point. Um, and yeah, thanks again so much. Bye. Thank you very much for doing this. And I will definitely check on the other panels on YouTube. All right. Thank yeah, you. me too. Thank you. Yeah, thank Bye. you so much. Bye.